Okay, so hello everybody. Uh, let me introduce you John Co uh, Joe Conway, who is a longtime contributor of PostgreSQL and who will talk about SageComp uh, for your PostgreSQL. Thank you. So is this mic back on? You hear me in the back, right? All right, good. All right, so like I said, uh, my name is Joe Conway. I've been um, working around and with the Postgres community for a lot of years, 20 plus years using Postgres. I've been a committer for about the last 16 or 17 years, I guess. And um, I'm on the PG infrastructure team. I'm also the VP of engineering for a company called Crunchy Data in the US. So I do, we do a lot of work with companies that care a lot about security, or organizations that care a lot about security, and so I've done a number of talks on security. Um, the way I like to think about it is kind of in a holistic way. Security involves protecting your database from the outside, right? The, the operating system that it's on, the box, actually getting to the box, how the operating system is protecting Postgres itself. Uh, also from the inside, Inside of Postgres, you lock down permissions so that only certain users can access certain tables and so on. So that's kind of the crunchy core. Um, and then, but once someone is inside your database, you have to worry about them finding some kind of a, uh, a bug in Postgres and exploiting it, right? So part of what you want to do to enhance security there is what I call confinement, so reducing attack surface. And that's what this talk is all about. It's about reducing attack surface once you're inside of Postgres using SecCom. And then the other aspect of security, which we should mention, is you should instrument. You should have monitoring alerting set up. And it should not just be monitoring alerting around performance issues. Things like monitoring, did someone restart my database? Sending an alert so that if someone re did restart your database, how come you didn't know about it? Or hopefully you did know about it. So what we're gonna do today is talk about, a little bit broadly about SecComp. I'm gonna show some example C code actually, just to give you a feel for how it works. Um, and then I'm gonna go into how you might use System D to, to set up SecComp for a service and then specifically for Postgres. And then I wrote an extension called pgseccomp, and so I'll end with that. The uh, repository for that is, uh, we, we just made it public about a week ago. It's brand new. I've not actually even done a release out of it yet, uh, but the code is pretty solid. I've been working on it for several months, and in fact, it originates from a patch that I submitted to the Upstream Postgres project last August, and the community was not quite ready for the idea of having uh, seccomp filters built in. So instead I implemented it as, a, as an extension, which is one of the great things about Postgres, that you can do a lot of things through extensions. So I'll talk about how that works and how to use that. So just give me a feel, how many people in here, I assume if you're in here you have some idea what SecComp is? Anyone? About half the room? Okay, so this is kind of, you know, this paragraph, I'm not gonna try and read it, is is um, from the, um, the documentation kernel.org. But basically, SecComp stands for Secure Computing with Filters. It's a filtering mechanism that's built into the kernel and it allows kernel attack surface reduction. Um, and what it allows you to do in kind of really high level, big picture, is it allows you to either block or at least audit what syscalls are made to the kernel. The original version of this was called strict mode. It came out in about 2005 in Linux 2.6, so it's been around quite a while. But this was pretty limited capability version of it. Basically, it was hard-coded. You know, you, the idea was that you would make a call to load seccomp, and at that point, the process irreversibly could only make these four syscalls. So you could basically exit, you can read and write from a file descriptor that's already open, and that's all you could do. So that you know had, I'm sure, some useful uh, applications, but it was pretty limiting. 
Um, and anything else, any other syscall would actually call the, cause the process to be killed immediately with syskill, sigkill. In 2012, SecComp filter mode came out, and this is also sometimes called SecComp BPF. I think I was at a talk yesterday and someone mentioned SecComp BPF. BPF is a built-in kernel facility for doing filtering. It was originally for packet filtering, but it can also be used for other things. And so this was used to add a flexible way to filter what syscalls you want to allow and which ones you don't want to allow and what action you want to take when they get called. And so, you know, this is kind of an oversimplification to some extent. There are more actions than this, but as far as the kind of basics, you can either, based on the syscall, you can add a rule that will say either kill the syscall, kill the process if the syscall is used, throw an error, and you get to supply the error number, log the event, so don't do anything, allow it, but log it in uh, audit D-log, or just simply allow the syscall. And so you can use these along with uh, the fact that you can set a default in your filter. So you can say, I want to build a white list or I can build a black list. If your default is allow and you set up rules for blocking certain syscalls, you've effectively built a black list. That's not what's recommended. What's recommended is you build a white list, which means you set your default to something like log or kill, and then you provide a specific list of syscalls that you want to allow. Now there's a library called libseccomp, um, I think written by Paul Moore, and um, that uses seccomp BPF, and it also is a nice interface to seccomp from the C program, so that's what I use for PG seccomp. I really have no idea what um, system D is doing internally, I didn't try and look at that. Um, So first off, you need to have SecComp built into your kernel with support for it. So the way you can check that is, is using this, this grep command. And you should see something like this, basically indicating that your, fil your kernel has been configured for SecComp. These days, I'd be pretty surprised if you came across one that wasn't. But it is worth checking anyway. This is a, kind of a little bit of a side issue, but there's um, another kernel parameter, basically, it's called no new privs. And what that does is it, it basically says that if you set no new privs, then the process and any child process of that process could never increase privileges. And in order to use seccomp as an unprivileged user, this has to be set, because otherwise it wouldn't make sense, because then and it, if you didn't have this set and you had some filters, you wouldn't want someone to be able to bypass those filters down the line. So in terms of libseccomp, the basic usage of it is that you're gonna init seccomp, as I said earlier, with some kind of a default action. You're going to add a number of rules for specific syscalls, and then you're going to load the filter. And you, you can load a filter, you can load multiple filters, and basically they just layer one on top of the other. The key aspect of this, again, being that once a filter is loaded, subsequent filters cannot reduce the requirements. So you cannot, at one point, say that for a syscall of right, I want to throw an error, and then later load a filter that says, I want to allow syscall right. That won't work, because the most restrictive action is the one that'll get used. So as I just said, once the filter's loaded, you cannot relax the restrictions. You can load multiple filters. And importantly, all child processes inherit all the active filters as well. They can set their own and the highest precedence action is always the one that's gonna be taken. So is this readable in the back? Good. So what I wanted to do here, that I had actually was doing this just to kind of in, investigate the behaviors of um, 
LibSecComp and SecComp in general. And as I was writing these slides and as I was doing the work on the extension, and one of the things that became clear to me, SecComp can be really um, kind of hard to understand and get your mind around if you haven't played with it a little bit. So this is kind of a simple example, and but it illustrates a number of important points. So just basically what I'm doing here, you know, I'm creating a uh, context for the set comp. I'm going to loop three times, so I'm basically going to create and load three set comp filters. On the, the first iteration, I'm going to allow, my write action is going to be allow. On the second iteration, it's going to be log, and on the third iteration, it's going to be allow. And so what I'm doing is I'm initting set comp with a default action of log, and then I'm adding a rule that says write syscall should be whatever my action is. So that in the first the first time through it'll be allow, the second time it will be log, and the third time it will be write allow. And then I'm going to load the filter. Now I'm going to try and use printf. And then finally at the end I'll release the context, and I'll just so I'll load three filters. When you do that. You know, so here's basically running um, running that compiled C code, and if you look through the audit log, what you find is you get these syscalls that get logged. Is that when I turn over? Is it too low in the back when I turn my head? It's all right. Okay, because I was getting the feeling it was louder when I was looking forward. So what's interesting to note here is the only thing I did really was call printf. You get all these syscalls get made, kernel syscalls. We'll go through this on the next slide, but syscall 5 ends up being fstat. These two syscalls end up being uh, PR control and uh, seccom. Syscall 1 is right, and this is uh, basically an exit return. And I'll talk ab about it a little bit later, but in, uh, in the PG set comp extension, I provide a little shell script that will basically pull just the names of the system calls out of the audit log and put them in a form that makes it very easy to use with the extension. So as you, <laughs> as you look at that simple bit of C code, what you're seeing is, first of all, before the first time you've loaded a filter, Nothing gets logged, right? Because there's no set comp filter loaded. So the first pass through, there were no no calls that were logged. But the very first thing you see is that printf calls fstat, but it only calls it once. And I, I don't even I haven't even really researched why that is. I assumed that that's because the first time it gets called, it needs to check to see if standard out is there. I suppose, right? And printf clearly requires write, but in that first filter I said write was allowed. So it did not get logged. Now in the second loop, I add a rule that says write should now be logged. And now all of a sudden we see the, the output in the log for PR control and seccomp because they were actually blocked in the first filter. And fstat, like I said, is no longer called. In the third loop, again, I see the PR control and set comp. That third loop tries to add an allow rule for write, but it's ineffective because it's already been blocked and I can't relax that restriction. And then finally, exit group gets called when the program exits. So there's a very simple program and yet a fair amount of stuff going on with syscalls. So this is a second example, and this one, I basically have specific allow rules for the, all of the other syscalls except for write. I'm still doing the, you know, log allow thing with the write. So otherwise, when you call it now, it, it looks a lot simpler because all the other syscalls I've specifically allowed. And now you can see that the write syscall gets, does not get logged the first time, but it does get logged the second two times because of that second filter. 
Does that make sense? Like I said, as you go through this, you really have to wrap your mind about what's going on. Otherwise, you sit there and you look at it and you say, what? You know, just like weird stuff's going on. So, you know, as I said, printf gets um, uses write and it gets logged twice. Okay, so now we're going to switch gears into system D uh, support for SecCom. Any questions about what I've talked about so far? Go ahead. Yeah, yeah, I, I'm going to get to that kind of, I'll, I'll talk about that more. Um, oh, so the question was, how do we map um, glibc calls to to s kernel syscalls, and I, I talk about that more kind of as I'm going through this. But I guess in short, um, it's not an easy thing to do, and everyone I've asked about it admits it's not an easy thing to do. Uh, there are ways to do it with things like uh, I guess ptrace, and and um, there are people who have written. Um, uh, BPF filters that do that kind of thing. Um, but what I found to be by far the easiest thing to do, which is really the only one I did do, was I wrote my own library for Postgres, right? And one of the things, and one of the reasons um, I only support kind of the latest versions of libseccomp because of two things. It, it uh, supports this log action, which the older kernels do not, and system D does not, which allow everything to happen, just like it would have happened, but everything goes to the log. Makes it really easy to kind of run your software through its paces. Now, as people in the Postgres community pointed out, that's not perfect, but um, what I will argue, I guess I'll argue it now instead of later, if you sufficiently run a production system through all of its paces, the regression test for your application, maybe all the regression tests for Postgres, maybe you make your default rule log for even six months, right? Let it run in production for six months and watch audit log. You're going to catch 99.9% .9 of all syscalls that Postgres is going to make in your audit log. And you can go, after you've done that initially, and I'll show you that process at the end, you're going to have the vast ones that pop up in syslog are going to be anomalies. You're going to go investigate and see, well, why did I get that? And then if you determine, oh, yeah, OK, in this very rare case, Postgres will use that syscall, fine. I add it to my allow list, and I restart Postgres. Um, but if it, there's no explanation for it, maybe the explanation is that someone's trying to compromise your system, right? So I think in practice, it's workable. And, but that allow action really makes it a whole lot simpler to figure out which syscalls you need. So a little bit of a long-winded answer, but hopefully that's good. So systemd supports syscomp filtering via some options. Um, there's an advantage to that in that the control over the use of seccomp in this case is now in the hands of your sysadmin, not your database admin. Sysadmin may see that as an advantage. Your database admin may not. Um, and it was also brought up on the Postgres mailing list that it may be more difficult, since it's kind of an external control from Postgres, it might be more difficult for someone who's trying to hack Postgres to subvert. I, you know, I think that's maybe a fair uh, comment. Um, it does require extra coordination. It, I did find it required extra syscalls to be allowed. And um, it, it gives you less flexibility. As I said, system D doesn't have quite the flexibility that I've got built into the, the extension that I specifically wrote for Postgres. Although I, it may well be that more recent versions of system D will have that. But I've, I've tried on Buster, and I've tried on RHEL 8. And so far, at least the versions of system D that I've found are not as flexible as I'd like. They don't have that log option specifically. 
The, the other thing that they don't have is, and I think I mentioned this in another slide, when you set the error action for a syscall, by default, when the error is thrown, it does not get audit logged, which means nothing shows up in audit D. You just get an error in your application. I find that very surprising and disconcerting also. So with libseccomp, you can specifically flip a switch that says, even if I've got an, aud an error action, I want it audit logged anyway. And that, to me, makes things a lot easier to figure out what's going on. So the first um, parameter that you use in system D is system call filter. Um, it's basically how you set up a whitelist. Um, the default action will be kill, and it's kill with a sig sys signal. Um, Seccomp does that, it's a non-blockable signal. So it's, you're gonna, the process is gonna get killed no matter what. You can override that with system call error number, which will basically let you supply an error number that will be used for the error action instead of killing the process. And you can specify it more than once in your systemd control file. You can also set up blacklists. If you use a tilde in front of the list, it basically inverts it. Um, if you suffix your element with a, a colon and a number or, or a colon and a name of an error, then it'll use that error for that syscall. Uh, but whitelisting is actually recommended. System D, one of the things that at first looked kind of neat, um, but later on I kind of decided was not as useful as it seems, is it has these predefined sets of syscalls. So you can say, I want to allow all of the system service syscalls, or I want to allow all the file system syscalls. And that, that kind of on the surface sounds like it would be convenient. The problem is that the list of syscalls in those lists could vary from systemd version to systemd version, could vary from kernel to kernel. Um, it could, you know, th there's a lot of variability. You don't, without inspecting it carefully, you don't know what you're getting. And if you combine that with the difficulty and figure out what syscalls you need to allow, I just ended up not wanting to go there. There is this systemd analyze syscall filter that will let you enumerate the actual filters, the actual syscalls that are in the filter sets. Syscall error number is what you, uh, allows the override of the default action, gives you the error action instead of the kill action. Um, but as, as I said earlier, it's not logged by default with systemd, and I couldn't figure out any way to turn on the logging in, with systemd. What's that? It's not implemented. So as a comment from the audience, it's not implemented in systemd. There's a, another primer called system call architectures. Uh, that's one of the kind of things that, again, makes this set comp difficult is the system calls are architecture specific. And you know, there's some nuances, like if you're on a 64-bit system, you might actually have available the 32-bit syscalls as well. And that can actually be in a path to um, exploits. So what you really want to do is restrict the syscalls to just the ones that are native for your architecture. And that's the keyword native. There is a, a parameter to set no new privileges. The documentation claims, and maybe I just misunderstood the documentation, but it, it claims that whatever this value is will be overridden if you use syscall filter, but with a little bit of experimentation, I'll show you what I mean, I didn't feel like that was true. So maybe I'm just misunderstanding the documentation, but um, in any case, I'll, I'll show you what I mean. So with Postgres specifically, trying to derive the, the whitelist was, was too painful. So although I'm doing the slides in the order of showing you the System D implementation before PGSecComp. I actually did PGSecComp first, and I got a list, and then I used that in System D, and that worked okay. Like I said earlier, there were actually extra syscalls that I needed, so I started out with that list, and then I tried to start Postgres, and it gets killed, and I go look and I see what the syscall is, and I add it to the list, and rinse and repeat. 
five or six times until I caught all the extra syscalls that were needed when I was starting Postgres using system D, and then finally Postgres would run. But I did determine that no new privileges needed to be set. So this is kind of a, an interesting way of looking at it. Um, if you look in um, proc PID number status, and you grep for you know, any of these three terms, you'll see before you lay, load seccomp, basically no new privs is not set, seccomp is not set, and your thread vulnerable for speculation store bypass. And what I'm showing here is just basically all of the Postgres processes. So now if I edit postgresql.service, uh, I, I didn't try, I want to list all of them here, but basically there's, you know, 94 syscalls that I determined were needed for Postgres. Add them to the call filter list. Um, I didn't, I, I left it as uh, an error. I didn't leave, I didn't make it an, I left it as kill, I mean, I didn't make it an error action. You can see I set the architecture to native, and for the, the first time out, I left no new privileges to yes. So now I'll restart the Postgres daemon and um, look at the audit log. So now when I go look, you can see no new privs is still set to zero. So it was not set by system D for me. That's the part I didn't quite get from the documentation. Set comp is set, and it's in mode two. Yes? Uh, no new privileges uses the second filter in the automatic setup. So if you manually tune the second filter, you must also apply the no new privileges. Okay. So the, the documentation was not really clear on that point to me, at least to me. Yes. So mode two for set comp is basically the set comp filter, which is the BPF filter. If that said one, it would be the original set comp, which I don't think anyone ever uses anymore. Um, and then you can see that spec by, as kind of a side benefit here, I get thread force mitigated for speculation store bypass. Just a note on that, uh, about a week or two ago, I tried this. Uh, this is all done on a latest Linux Mint machine, which I guess is based on Ubuntu 18.04, I guess. Um, and that's what I see there. On a latest Fedora machine, which I tried just a week or two ago, I did not get the um, speculation store bypass mitigated. And I'm not, I haven't really investigated why that is yet. So now if we uncomment no new privileges and run all this again, we'll see that we do get um, no new priv set. Okay, so that's, that's it for... Um, the system D implementation. Any questions about that before I move on? Sure. Will this be in the official package? Uh, the PG seccomp? No, uh, I mean the uh, uh, system D filter. Oh, you, so the question is, will this be in the official packaging and specifically the system D filtering? I've not talked to anyone about that. No one's asked me about that. Um, the packaging for Postgres and therefore the service file, I guess, is done by one of the Postgres community members. So conceivably that could be done, yeah. I could talk to Kristoff and see if he's willing to do that. Good point. So as I said, PGSecComp, um, the repository for that, sorry, this is my refrigerator temperatures. Um, is in, uh, so my company name, Crunchy Data, PGSecComp, it's basically the Postgres license. Uh, it was just released, it was just opened up a week ago. Uh, I've not done an actual official release. And just to forestall the, the probably inevitable question, I don't know whether this will get packaged by Debian or not, but again, I could talk to Christoph about it and I could talk to Devrim about maybe the RPMs. But um, it's, it's literally just been opened up within the last week. I wrote this over the last several months because of the fact that, you know, for the people who weren't here earlier, I had tried to get this in the core Postgres and the community was not willing to take it, so I implemented it as, a, as an extension. So this is seccomp filtering through Postgres config options. 
And I think there's a lot of advantages to this. Not everyone agrees. But it gives the Postgres admin control over the seccomp filtering. And, and by the way, there's no reason this can't be used in conjunction with systemd. So as I pointed out earlier, um, you can add filters down the line as long as you're making things more restrictive. And in fact, when Postgres runs in a container on Kubernetes, which my company does a lot of with our customers, it's already running under seccomp because containers do have, I think it's a blacklist filter, not a whitelist. There's about 350 syscalls, and they blacklist about 50 of them, so they allow 300 or so. I've found that Postgres needs about 100, so that leaves a lot of room for improvement as far as security posture goes. But in any case, it provides more flexibility. Um, it does have the, uh, the log action. Um, it does ensure that if you use the error action, it gets logged. Um, it allows you to have different settings at the, the postmaster, which is the parent Postgres process level and the session level. And it also allows you to have different filters at the session level based on the user that's logged into Postgres. And then finally, it also allows, there's a client command, which I'll show you, which allows even the client application to set its own filter. So now you can imagine, you know, the system administrator enforces some basic level of seccomp filtering with systemd. The database administrator enforces some seccomp filtering at the postmaster and the session level. And then the person writing the application can even lock it down further the first thing they do out of the gate, and then it can never be relaxed for the rest of the session. So now, if you know, you're really talking about layering security. Now, if someone figures out how to do SQL injection to your app, you've you've blocked stuff as as far as you can block it. And you know, it was pointed out it might be less resilient to the system D method, but you could use it in conjunction. And of course, the other thing you can do, in order to change the values at the postmaster level for this extension, you have to restart Postgres. And again, for the benefit of the people that weren't here at the beginning, good security practices, if Postgres restarts, you better get an alert. And if you didn't plan that restart, you better figure out why it restarted. Okay, so it's implemented as a Postgres extension. It's loaded via shared preload libraries, um, which basically means it's loaded immediately. Postgres won't start if it doesn't load, uh, which is maybe a good point. If you have some kind of a syntax error when you go edit your postgres.conf to do this, and you go to start Postgres, and it doesn't start, it might be because you made a syntax error. Postgres error log should tell you that. It is, um, there's a global config setting, which is the postmaster level it requires a restart. The client settings are done through something called the client authentication hook, which happens immediately after the client authenticates, but before the client gets access to the session. So it's before there any user input is taken. The client filters require a reload, not a restart, which is kind of important uh, if, you want to be able to modify the client settings as the administrator uh, without having to restart your whole database. Now again, this may be something that someone complains about and says it would be more secure to require a restart. I found that kind of hard to work with. I think this is good enough. This is still like, you know, version one of this, so maybe I could be convinced of otherwise later on, but for now that's the way it is. And it provides this uh, seccomp filter table function, which will actually show you the merged filter, what it looks like in your back end, to the best of its ability. And the reason I say that is because there's, you know, in addition to the fact that there's no easy way to know which syscalls are used by which glibc calls, there's also no way to read from the kernel and find out what the loaded filter looks like. So if, if a filter was loaded by system D, this extension has no idea about that, or Kubernetes, for that matter. And, I, and I've talked to the kernel maintainers about that, and they said, yeah, that would be pretty cool. 
Um, I'm not sure how hard it would be to implement or if it's even possible. But um, so in any case, in order to enable this, you have to have shared preload libraries set to at least pgseccomp. You might have other stuff in there, maybe pgaudit if you care about security. Um, that's a whole other talk. pgseccomp.enabled is your overall on-off switch for this feature. The global configuration, which is at the postmaster level, you know, we'll see an example of this later, but um, basically there's four of these. One that's, that, you know, underscore allow, underscore log, underscore error, underscore kill. Those are each specific lists. And then there's a default action. So you can basically set the default action to log, and you could have a list of items that you want um, to allow. And you could have a specific list maybe of syscalls that you never want to allow um, that are set to error or kill. And then similarly at the session level, you've got the equivalent calls session instead of global. And then this session roles business, this is a um, little sidebar. When I went to implement this, Postgres does allow you to specify specific settings that are bound to a specific user. However, those settings are read in later than that client authentication hook that I'm using. And so there was no way to get to those, basically using this extension. Now, maybe some future version of Postgres I can convince the community to add a hook in the right location. But right now, there isn't one in a better location. So the way I did this was basically you provide a list of specific roles that are going to have specific set comp filters. And then you have this, each of these entries again, except dot with the role name on the end. And that will give you a list that's specific for that logged in user. And that will get used instead of the default session one when someone logs in. And then finally, as I, I talked about earlier, for an application, you could call this SQL statement and you can create a filter on the fly dynamically. It can only be called once per session. If you try and call a second time, it'll throw an error. Um, just because I think that would be confusing because it wouldn't do anything. So this is, now this is my 10 step process for deriving your list of syscalls, at least for Postgres. So if you set this as your, in your postgresql.conf, um, you're going to enable set comp, you're going to allow everything at the global level, and you're going to log everything at the um, session level. And just a note here, and it says it in this, in, on the slide, an asterisk at the session level basically means just use whatever's in the, the global list. I just found that to be a, a useful notation. So you do that. Um, when you're doing this, I, you don't want to do this on your production machine, please. Um, you're going to want to modify AuditD. Uh, I found that AuditD actually by default is um, lossy. So if you overload AuditD, you start losing audit records, which I find a bit strange, actually. So you, you want to make it lossless. And you also don't want the files rotating out of your way because this, when you first run this, you will get very large growth of your audit D log very quickly. So if you clear out audit D and basically restart the service, restart Postgres after making all these changes, now, you know, this is what I alluded to earlier, you want to exercise Postgres through as many paces as you can do. So you want to run all your application regression tests. You basically want to try and get your application to use the database to do everything it might possibly do. You might also want to run like the Postgres regression tests. I've got the, the formulas here. Um, interestingly, this is how you use the make check world and specify some extra stuff to go into the configuration, which you would need in order to test this. Um, when you run these, you will add a lot of set comp entries to the audit D log. So at this point, stop audit D, run the script that I provided with the extension that I talked about earlier, 
and then you, it'll just give you a list that you can cut and paste into the session syscall allow. <clears throat> Excuse me. So now you're basically going to repeat, repeat this at the global level and paste that into the global syscall allow. And now, you know, I've found over time that, you know, as we talked about earlier, it's, it's not 100% deterministic fi figuring out which syscalls are made because some syscalls are only made when certain things happen. Maybe something gets flushed or, you know, I can't even explain all the reasons why it might happen, but I did find that if I re-ran this two or three times, I might catch one or two other syscalls. Now, at this point, optionally, you might decide to change your defaults to error or kill. As I said earlier, I think probably what you would want to do is leave it set to log for some period of time, implement all this in production, and then monitor your audit D log for some period of time and see if anything else pops up. And it should be fairly lightweight at this point. It shouldn't happen very often, but when it does, go investigate and see if you can figure out using the Postgres source or whatever, why you got this syscall, and if you can convince yourself that it was legitimately Postgres, add it to the allow list. If it wasn't legitimately Postgres, you better figure out why that happened. So on an ongoing basis, you would want to monitor Postgres and React as required. So a question? Uh, so the question is, since the process is not killed, is there a way to get basically a stack trace or something to help you, aid you in figuring out where the origin of the syscall was? And um, there's a patch that was being talked about, and I can't remember if it's actually been committed for 13, Postgres 13, that would allow you to configure basically getting stack traces, I believe, but I'm not sure if... First of all, that's going to be Postgres 13, which is not out, if it's in there. And so in, in my imagination, what, you, what I would do is I would start Googling and start grepping through the Postgres source. I mean, I, I, can't, I don't honestly have a great answer for that. I don't have a lot of experience using this yet. This is, this, like I said, this project is brand new. The requirement for this actually is fairly new. Um, I was driven to it because we have large organizations we work with that are starting to make this a requirement. So there's still some, some place, place to learn. But if, if you figure out something that's, that's better, I would love to hear about it. OK, so now I just want to go through a couple of examples. I'm kind of running out of time, so I'm going to try and do this quickly. Um, in this example, I'm basically going to block the read link syscall. So initially, if I create a table space and I say, um, you can see here, this is the use of that um, setcom filter. So the, this output shows me that the read link syscall, which is number 89, at the session level is set to allow, and the, and the context is session. Um, if I now go use read link using this call, you know, my call works. But now if I move read link from allow to error and restart, or reload at least, and you can see now I'm set to error, and I rerun this and I'll get a permission denied. Here's an example. I cannot reduce the restriction on nano sleep. So if I add nano sleep in the session allow, but it's already in the global list for log, you can see that it's still going to get logged. This example, I'm going to block clone. So this is kind of an interesting one. A lot of, you know, I don't know how many people are familiar with PG Perl U. PG Perl U is basically the untrusted version of PG Perl. You can do things like shell out and run stuff, which can be really useful, but it's also potentially dangerous, right? 
So in this example, I create a PL Perl U function that's going to let me cat a file and, it, and, ex, and send it to the client as output. And you can see that works, right? So now if I add clone to the session error, I'm going to get an error. So now I'm going to create a special entry for the user Joe that does not have clone as an error. And now when I log in as Joe, you can see I can use that function again. So basically I can use this to say Joe is allowed to use PL Perl U to shell out and do stuff, whereas everyone else is not. Five minutes. Okay, and then finally I'm going to show how that client, set client filter could be used now. Even though I'm logged in as Joe, I can run, create a, a client filter right here with this call, which will again deny using the, the clone syscall. And so that is it. Um, I've got, I guess, four minutes left for questions. Oh, thank you for this excellent talk, and we have some time for our questions. So, does anybody has a question? You said that it's possible to reduce privileges at a later point. Um, I'm an OpenBSD developer. We have Pledge, and what we found was that it's possible with quite a lot of applications to hoist some of the codes to the initialization phase and then drop additional privileges. Uh, did you have similar experience with Postgres? Did you find certain components that were like, okay, this is where I drop some privileges, but I need, uh, need those privileges here, but actually it can be done in initialization. Did you find some of those cases? So if I, do I need to repeat the question again since you use the mic? Yeah. I do. So let me see if I can summarize that a little bit. Um, so the, the, you, you found that with certain applications, you can basically, when you initialize, you need more syscalls available. Later on, you can restrict and, and get away with kind of a, re a reduced surface area, right? And so yes, absolutely, that's true. Um, actually, the, the filters that I've developed for Postgres using PGSecComp, there are more syscalls required at the global level than at the session level. And so the session level actually is already in, in the filters that I've developed using that 10-step process is already more restrictive for the client than it is for the global level. One of the things that's kind of related to that that you don't really ask about but I'll talk about a little bit, that Postgres has like, I forget exactly, but it's like seven or eight processes that spin up when it starts. There's the postmaster, but then there's a, some auxiliary processes. One of the things we've looked into is some of those auxiliary processes in particular probably need quite a few less syscalls. Unfortunately, there's not a good way to hook into specific processes to reduce the surface area of those so far. One of the things that I hope we will get into a future version of Postgres is some additional hooks so that this could be extended so that, for instance, the auto vacuum daemon that runs as part of Postgres probably needs far less syscalls than a session, normal session does. But that's not something that's possible to do yet. But, you know, as I said, you can restrict at the session level, and you can even restrict Postgres as opposed to the systemd, because as I talked about, systemd actually needed more syscalls than just starting up Postgres does. So if you use this with systemd, you'd have a bigger list with systemd, slightly smaller list with the global list for Postgres and a slightly smaller list at the session level that you're allowing. Okay. Any other question? Does it have a, an impact in terms of latency, latency treatment? I, I'm sorry, can you repeat that? Does it have a, a, an impact in terms of latency treatment? So an impact on latency? Yeah. So does it have yeah. an impact so on performance in general? You right. Mean? I've not done any measurements for, for performance uh, at this point. Uh, you know, I didn't see anything noticeable. Okay. Uh, actually, I mean, you'll see something noticeable when you're going through that process and everything's getting written to 
the audit D log, if it's all in the same machine, that'll have a noticeable impact. But once you kind of clean up your filter so not every, every query is getting logged, um, you know, the, the performance goes back to more or less normal. I, I'm sure, yes, I should at some point do some more rigorous performance testing to see what the impact of it is. But, you know, the reality is that places that care about this kind of stuff are probably willing to make that trade-off. Um, I don't know if, if you have time to go into this, um, but um, second, I don't know that th thoroughly, but um, if you have uh, like um, the way Postgres implements uh, uh, certain functions, it's kind of separated uh, within specific processes. So um, is it possible to have a second um, uh, a different second rules for different uh, system processes within the Postgres, for example, replication or uh, like a di different kind of profile for different processes? So the question is, is it possible to have different profiles for different processes within Part, Postgres? Parts of the po Postgres processes. Yeah, and, and that's actually, that's what I was just talking about a minute ago. Um, there are these extra daemons that are launched that are kind of auxiliary processes. Right now, they just get what the postmaster gets because there's really no convenient way to hook into them. But I hope that in the future, I'll be able to improve that. I, I think that's probably it. Right? We're done? Yeah, we're done. So <laughs> thank you again for this excellent talk. And please raise an applause for him.